So thank you very much. Now our next panelist is uh, uh, Mr. Noshir Kaka. He is the Managing Director of McKinsey India. Uh, move towards uh, uh, these objectives uh, in a very, very interesting way. So thank you very much. Now our next panelist is uh, uh, Mr. Noshir Kaka. He is the Managing Director of McKinsey India. Thank you. Maybe I should go there. Thank you. Thank you, Ramesh. Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. This uh, piece of uh, rapid fire presentation. Uh, is actually originated in a piece of work that the McKinsey Global Institute did on disruptive technologies around the world. It was released about six months ago. And seeing that, I think both Dr. Mashelkar and, and Sam also asked us to see if we could do a piece of work which is similar for India on how disruptive technologies are going to affect society in India. And this is our working draft and our attempt to do that. Now, before I go in, the big thing about making predictions about technology, as you know, is there are only three things that you can take for granted. Number one, you will get the precise technology absolutely wrong. Number two, you'll get the time frame for impact absolutely wrong. And number three is you'll actually also get the scale of impact, either underestimated or overestimated. And the only thing that differentiates a good report from an average one is the extent of error that you make. So with that caveat, I'm going to run you through the little bit that we have here. Why is disruptive technology essential for India when you think about the change that you need to make in India? And just three very, very simple points. Um, in fact, I'll go to a slide which is a bit later. Um, if you look at the challenge facing India in almost any sector of relevance to society, it is not only enormous, but more importantly, it is unachievable with the historic trajectory that we have done almost anything. So take food, for example. We need to better feed, rough error of estimate, 300 to 400 million Indians, and that's 50 times the drop in malnutrition that's been done in the last 15 years, 50 times. We obviously need to provide health care to 250 or more million Indians in primary health care. That's equal to the U.S. population. We are simply not going to get this level of change without technology. And this is not all. The problem actually is compounded. Has anyone seen this photograph before? Does anyone know what this is? This is Baxter. Baxter was a robot designed by MIT Digital Labs. Um, the interesting part about Baxter is that the he or she can actually be programmed by a shop floor worker by literally picking up Baxter's hands and showing what needs to be done. And most importantly, Baxter costs $20,000 all in. Foxconn, the world's largest manufacturer, just announced that they would hire, out of a 1.3 million population in its workforce, 300,000 robots. Right? The pace of our social change needs to be accelerated because technology is also a disruptive force in that. So what are the 10 things that we have, with the help of many of you, and I should thank all of you for your time, that we have, I would say, shortlisted. We've not prioritized. We've not said that these are the only technology changes. But we think that these are the 10 elements which, when taken together, will create a disruptive force of change to sectors and society. I will just comment on a couple of them. We know 
that unconventional energy sources, if untapped in India, will lead India's oil bill already at the single largest decimal point, uh, percentage of, of overall imports, which is about 43%, to actually double. Unless we are able to explore all kinds of energy sources, off-grid, on-grid, solar, and shale. Just to give you a sense, that is the scale of impact we have to exploit or explore. We think that these 10 technologies, and there will probably be others that we haven't named here, when taken together, can disrupt a variety of sectors. We think at least six or seven sectors will be, in our words, hopefully reimagined. Let me give you an end with one lovely example. I started with a terrifying one. I'll end, hopefully, with a nice one which is the photograph on the right-hand side of that page. That is the photograph of a boy in Mongolia. He happens to be one of about 150,000 people who took, at 13 years age, it's not 13, is not the normal age, who took uh, the second year engineering test at MIT for a particular class. He happens to be only one of 350 people around the world who got every single answer right, and thereby maxed the course while in Mongolia. Now that's the interesting bit in itself, but what is even more interesting is what he did with that knowledge. As you can see, he's playing in a little playground. His playground happens to be on a road that is around a bend. And he witnessed that his younger sister was actually playing on the road, and cars would often come across around the bend at high speed, not knowing that the, that the little girl was playing on the road. He designed a sensor to warn his sister before the car came anywhere in sight. Social technology, impact technology, at scale. If Mongolia can do this, and a child all the way across the world can do this. We think the opportunity to reimagine education, healthcare, government to citizen services, energy, agriculture is only just around the corner. And with the help of the National Innovation Council and the entire team here, we hope to make these examples and this knowledge available to more people in India. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nasheer. Very fascinating presentation. Uh, May I move on now to the next panelist, uh, uh, Catherine Stevens, the Acting Mission Director of USAID. Thank you very much. I'm very pleased to join you today for this Innovation Roundtable, and I'd like to thank the National Innovation Council for inviting me. USAID has been active in India since 1951, and quite a lot has changed uh, during, that, during that time. From an early focus on the emergency provision of food aid, we are now, um, we've now completely transformed our approach. We're in the, the first year of a five-year strategy that is centered on the idea that we need to do business in India in a new way, on, on an equal basis in partnership, and that innovation is a vital means to an end in all of the sectors that we focus on. We recognize that there are vast opportunities to partner with the public and private sector at all levels in India to devise solutions and scale them, to generate social benefits and commercially viable products, uh, services and technologies that, can, that are uniquely suited to benefit those with limited means, both in India and globally. Within this new vision, we're reaching out to a very broad range of, of stakeholders, entrepreneurs, venture capitalists, foundations, financial institutions, corporations, investors, philanthropists, and many others, to join forces with them to derive meaningful solutions in all of our priority areas, which range from health, to food security, to clean energy and environment and education. 
With these new partners, we define innovation as products, technologies, and services, processes, or business models that help to reach the last mile. We're supporting all three stages of innovation, from prototype development in stage one through scale up in stage three. Uh, we're placing increasing emphasis on scale, because I think we all recognize that there's been a lot of good work done on sourcing, but that many pilots haven't gone any further because uh, the potential for scale is not considered up front. Our innovation programs in India fall into three main categories. The first are sector-specific platforms that support innovation in a, in a key development area, such as food security or early grade reading, either at the base of the pyramid in India or globally. The second category are global programs with significant participation by India. And the third are cross-cutting innovation platforms like the Millennium Alliance and the India Partnerships and Annual Program Statement. An example of the first sector-specific program is our India-Africa Agriculture Innovations Bridge Program, which is picking up Indian innovations and sharing them with African countries, and particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, for increased food security and nutrition. Three recent awards will bring a low-cost tractor or an organic fertilizer and a solar dryer from India to Africa. These solutions have strong potential to increase farmers' agricultural yields and incomes by mechanizing their operation, fertilizing depleted soils, and pre preventing post-harvest losses. In the second category, global programs, I'd like to mention that USAID Washington really has a global focus on innovation through programs like the Development Innovation Ventures Grant Fund. The, the DIV grants support market-based social enterprises that have the potential to provide financial returns and yield positive social and economic returns. An example here in India is Miragao Power, started by a young Indian American uh, that's deploying ultra-low cost lighting and mobile phone charging solutions to individual houses and villages by operating solar-powered microgrids at the village level. They're currently attracting equity investment from the private sector as well. Another approach that aid has pursued uh, globally is crowdsourcing solutions through grand challenges. An example is the All Children Reading Grand Challenge, which is a multi-year partnership that focuses on finding and funding game-changing innovations with the potential to dramatically improve reading scales, skills among primary grade children in the developing world. Five of the 32 winners are here in India, and we're seeing similar, similar uh, statistics on all of the grand challenges that, that uh, USAID is, con is supporting worldwide. Finally, we're supporting two major uh, cross-cutting platforms here in India. Uh, with FICI and the Technology and Development Board, we're supporting the Millennium Alliance. And the Alliance, together with DFID, ECO, and ICICI Foundation, is bringing together social innovators, philanthropic organizations, venture capitalists, angel investors, and corporate foundations to support innovators with seed funding, networking opportunities, knowledge sharing, and access to capital. In the first round of the Millennium Alliance uh, grants, we received nearly 1,500 applications, and nine were selected through a very competitive and transparent process for support. We're currently seeking applications for the second round. It runs through the end of November. I'd like to add that um, this is a U.S. government-wide area of emphasis. Um, our Department of State colleagues are also very active in the innovation space. The U.S. India Science and Technology Endowment Board provides grants of up to $400,000 to selected innovators and entrepreneurs that are developing promising solutions with broad societal impact. It has to date awarded nine grants, and they've just announced their fourth call for applications in health, water, sanitation, and clean energy. In closing, I'd like to say that we continue to seek partnerships with a one-to-one -one match with local organizations through our India Partnerships APS. This is a, a unique program for aid in that it allows us, after receiving a, a five-page concept paper, to actually co-design an innovation platform with, with a a partner or group of partners. So it's an exciting time to be here at USAID India as we imagine how to foster scalable, sustainable, and impactful solutions that improve people's lives at the base of the pyramid, not only here in India, but globally. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kathleen, for that.
wonderful presentation and thank you for donating some time which we badly need. Uh, we move on to Professor Anil Gupta, doesn't need an introduction, uh, is the father of grassroots innovation movement in India. Anil. Can I have the presentation? Thank you, sir. I would first like to pay tribute to some of the good ideas that I have learned. There are many more, but I'll just mention a few. The recall of Tagore's poem by a Swedish friend was a wonderful thing. Uh, the idea that you could work for 400 hours and pay your tuition fees from Thailand was a remarkable idea, made my day. Uh, the CISOs, our st startup village generating 135 companies in two, two years is a remarkable thing. The fact that small companies generate jobs and the big companies kill them, what our friend mentioned from OECD was equally remarkable. Having said this, let us see how we have tried to learn from the Honeybee Network experience. Uh, there is a great reliance I found uh, when we discovered the patterns in our innovation database on circular economy in the innovation that grassroots innovators develop. Uh, circular economy is cradle to cradle, which means that there is nothing which cannot be used further for future. And the kind of frugality that it has is very flexible, friendly, and of course affordable. Now, Dr. Mashilka mentioned this, and I want to underline this, that I had set up, helped in setting up the first incubator at our institute, Innovation Management Ahmedabad, CIIE, uh, 10 years ago, but if I were to do it today, I wouldn't do it. Because incubators work for technologies or uh, areas where domain characteristics are known and also platform is known. But if you want to work through, work in areas of breakthroughs where neither domain is known nor platform, we need to set up sanctuaries. In sanctuaries, the chaos is inside and order is outside. In incubator, the chaos is outside and order is inside. If what is going to become uncertain, unpredictable, then probably sanctuary model is the way to go ahead in future. Uh, there are very many examples of innovations from which we can learn how a small windmill of 5,000 rupees triggers many lessons. And I would like to mention that lessons can be learned at several levels. One can learn artifactual, where replication of the same concept uh, with a similar design, maybe some improvement, changing materials. So windmill to windmill is an artifactual, analogic, that means metaphorical, heuristic, where the models of thinking are changed, and gestalt, where configuration of factors is taken take, take into account. So this is artifactual, where a windmill is being used to uh, run a ceiling fan in a village hut. Class two boy who gave this idea in an ignite competition from Jalgaon, Mohammed Hanif Patel. He got an award from Dr. Kalam last year. Uh, Self-cleaning molecular material, this is an analogic level innovation where taking the lotus leaf as a template, you create a material surface by a student of PhD, advanced student. He got award from Dr. Mashelka today, this year, March, at uh, techpedia.in, is an analogic innovation. And this is the guest art level where there's a bridge made by pulling the roots from two sides of the river. It's a real bridge from Meg Meghalaya, Megriat village. And this bridge could not have been built unless three things were put together, technology, institutions, and culture, technology like word, institutions like grammar, and culture like thesaurus. Uh, the question is, if inclusive ecosystems are inclusive, why don't we see fish fly? And that is a question that I would like to dwell upon further. So I want to refer to one of the breakthrough innovations we had recently. A tribal community in Rajasthan and Gujarat provided us a knowledge which when blended with the knowledge of Tata Steel and NML, National Meteorological Lab in Jamshedpur, helped us develop graphene, a material of the future, at a cost nobody can imagine. All over the world it is developed by using CBD method, which is very costly. Now this is going to be the material for future for chips. India could not make any stride when it came to silicon chip, because we couldn't make silicon wafer. But when it comes to graphene wafer, we may have been able to make from six layers to 10 layer graphene wafer. So there is a breakthrough innovation here, which will be disruptive, completely disruptive in the field of information processing, drug delivery and whatnot. And the patent is being filed along with the communities in the regions of Gujarat and Rajasthan. So there's a possibility of learning formal and informal knowledge blending and with a proper uh, attribution, acknowledgement and benefit sharing. 
So where are the hooks to hang ideas and where do we find them? So our president has decided to inaugurate a national innovation club in every central university of which he's a director and an IT. And these clubs do four things. Search, spread, sense the unmet needs, and celebrate the achievers. Search sp innovations, spread innovations, sense the unmet needs, and celebrate the achiever. Every university of our country eventually will have an innovation club which will do these things, and I will invite everybody to be able to think as to why not we do it everywhere, every college, every place. Uh, there are energy innovations of uh, amazing nature developed by the communities in Northeast and Andhra Pradesh, which tell us that waste heat of a stove cannot be wasted, and yet we haven't changed the design of our kitchen. So how do we learn from practical knowledge which can change the way we think about this? And let me refer to this platform, which is to me very important because it has done what we did in NNIF, National Innovation Foundation pooled about 170,000 ideas from 550 districts over the last so many years, 25 years it took us. But in Techpedia, we did it in about four years, 167,000 engineering projects by 400,000 students from 600 colleges. And the idea is that no student of our country should ever do what has been done before. So we want to raise the originality quotient. You will not find MIT and Stanford project at one place, nor would you find the projects done by the engineering students in Sweden at one place. But in India, we have done that more or less to a large extent, and it will become much more robust in years to come. So there are a lot of innovations which are coming out. For instance, a vitamin B12 deficiency can be identified now in 15 minutes instead of 24 hours. You, the three students from IIT Madras, IIT Bombay, and DICT developed a portable spectrophotometer for finding out water quality. There are a large number of such innovations that have been developed. Uh, Chetna, a device developed by uh, three students from IIT Guwahati, which will help a pregnant woman track all parameters during her pregnancy, and whenever parameters go out of the range, it advises what should be done, who should be consulted, and where so that during the nine months, complete advisory in the hand of every pregnant woman. Assam has highest maternal mortality rate, and now with these devices distributed to 400 centers of primary health center, this would have come down drastically. This girl has developed, Shanu has developed a, uh, a three-wheel three -wheel, uh, 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 chair, wheelchair for the physically challenged people, which can climb the stairs. I don't think any country present here had the wheelchair which climbed the stair, powered manually, not by motor. Has any of these ideas received support? None at all. This is the greatest weakness of our ecosystem, unfortunately, but we are working on it. Uh, we have discussed this in the National Innovation Council that how do we create a separate window of opportunity which would support the idea that the proof of concept, they are not yet ventures. They are not enterprisable. They are proof of concept, they have to become prototype, prototype to product, then they will be ventureable. Now, unless we support these ideas, they will die down. And this is a problem in most countries, I would say, as I heard in the morning. So we need to provide a system. All of you have refrigerators in your home. Or all of you know that refrigerator produces heat. None of you have a device which converts that heat into anything useful. Here is an innovation by Dhruv, where he takes with the heat exchanger, take the heat, makes a hot chamber to keep the food warm and give you hot water. When you take the heat away from the compressor, compressor works less, you consume 20% less electricity. This is the model of innovation that India wants to produce. Frugal innovations where you consume less, and as Dr. Mashelkar says, more from less for many. This is an example of that kind of an innovation. He gave award last year to this innovation. And yet we haven't been able to take it forward because of the one weakness in our ecosystem. But I was talking to our friend from Malaysia, Mark Rosario, and I, was I will tell everybody of you here, if you find use for the, any of these innovations in your country, kindly join hands. Once they are supported in Sweden or India or Malaysia, Sweden or Malaysia or UK, probably Indian will also support them. You know, that's a colonized mind that we have. Many times when things find traction abroad, they find traction within the country. So I will invite all of you to see whether we can join hands and take these ideas forward because they are universally applicable. Refrigerators are everywhere. No company manufacturing refrigerator has ever harnessed the heat of the compressor. Please appreciate that. So if you make a retrofitting device, you can reduce the carbon intensity of the economy by 20% because we are reducing car electricity consumption by 20%. So why can't we pool the knowledge, and that's a very major challenge, that pooling between, within the country, pooling across the country. So this is a device, uh, medicine developed by pooling knowledge from six different communities. We need to have many more such models where traditional knowledge can be pooled to develop new solutions. 
So yesterday we had a seminar in Pune, as Dr. Mashkulkar mentioned, on social innovations, and we said, why don't we create a national sanctuary for social innovation, where the ecosystem has so far, we have been able to tackle technological innovations. But what about cultural? What about educational? What about health? What about other administrative innovations? So to create a space for that, we had a wonderful meeting yesterday. Dr. Kelkar and Dr. Mashelka chaired that. And we are now able to create, understand that there's a need for this kind of a platform also, so that the institutional context for the technological innovation can be made more robust. One of the innovations that we have recently is a, is a methodological innovation, to, if one may say so, and National Innovation Council, National Innovation Foundation, and everybody else together in IMA. We went to Odisha, 2.6 million trees were uprooted during recent cyclone. We said, we won't wish this much of biomass to ever become available. Now that it is available, what do we do with it? So the roots, the bark, the twigs, and the leaves of this can be used for developing a lot of commercial products. So we want a knowledge-based rehabilitation model. Meeting took place on 12th with Chief Secretary and various other industries, processes on. Now this is the kind of model that we want to develop. Philippines has had a disaster recently. Maybe this model can be tried there and everywhere, wherever larger scale destruction takes place. Several colleagues from the NIS National Innovation Council have offered to support, and I'm sure this will work very well. We have a grassroots to global model where grassroots innovations are going all over the world. I would not take more time but just to say that we would be very happy to engage with all of you because we have innovations from children, students, informal sector, professionals at all levels, and they all are waiting to be tabbed and blended with the high-tech as well as uh, high-impact high impact investment funds and other uh, institutions which are working in this area. So an idea that matters does not need to be ideal. That's the first message. Let us not make best the enemy of better. There's a lot of scope for these ideas. Second, mind on the margin, of course, are not marginal minds. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Anil, again, for such an inspiring uh, and challenging, if I may use that word, uh, talk. May I now move to our ninth panelist. Believe it or not, we are coming to the tenth panelist. Uh, Minakshi Nath, uh, she is the deputy head, uh, DFID India. Thank you. I'm happy to be bringing up the base of the panel uh, with Shelley. Um, so I'm really pleased to talk about uh, what DFID is doing uh, in this uh, area of innovation. And uh, there's lots that we are doing on the government side, but I'm here to talk mostly about what we are doing on the private sector side. And I think a lot of it takes off from where uh, Professor Anil Gupta stopped, which is there are innovations out there. How can we harness them uh, for the good of many? They're just loading my presentation. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, we will not uh, let the best be the enemy of the good, Professor. <laughs> and uh, we shall carry on. Yes. <laughs> uh, so uh, most of you will know that uh, DFID's traditional focus has been on social sectors and working with the government. But there's been quite a distinct shift recently. So the new ministers uh, are very keen to centralize economic development. Uh, the reason is that evidence shows that it's growth that has really um, reduced poverty in the last few decades. Poor people, not surprisingly, want jobs. That's their topmost priority, sustainable jobs. And thirdly, governments need tax revenue that gets generated from the private sector to run social schemes. This shift has actually played itself out much earlier in the India program than in the rest of DFID. So what are we doing about economic development in India? So our strategy is that we will do the most difficult things in the most difficult places. And by that, what we mean is that we will promote private investment that is innovative, which will benefit poor people in the eight low-income states of India, as consumers, as producers, and workers. So we've set ourselves the target of going to those eight states where regular capital doesn't normally flow. And we've set ourselves the task of tackling those kind of innovations that don't 
normally receive capital support. Apart from development, we want to be uh, additional. So we will only finance those innovations which clearly will not get financed from the regular private sector because that would be distorting. And we do realize that the money that we have is not enough to tackle the entire problem, so the focus is on demonstration, so that regular capital starts to believe in some of the innovations and the business potential uh, of these. At the moment, we have 250 million pounds already committed. We are working through partners like um, National Innovation Council, National Housing Bank, SIDB, and so on. And we are, we are set to increase that uh, commitment beyond 250 million. This represents a mix. So we have equity, we have concessional loan, and we have grant, all working at different levels to solve this problem. So the new instrument that has been introduced by DFID, uh, and especially through its India program, is what we call returnable capital. So normally DFID has done grants, so we spend about 11 billion of pounds of grant every year. And now we are beginning to move towards the use of equity and loans as well. And this is being tried out in India for the first time. Obviously, if you want to support the private sector, grants is not the right instrument. So, so this has been introduced. Um, and we continue to use grant because you do need grant to build the ecosystem, perhaps to take uh, innovations through the proof of concept, uh, to help policies and so on. But it will be a smaller proportion of this overall program in terms of money, but not in terms of effort. The third thing we will begin to look at a lot more than we used to is the overall UK offer. So earlier DFID was used to, you know, really working with its grant money, but actually UK has a lot more to offer than just, just the grant money. So for instance, we are working with our uh, colleagues in the High Commission, in other parts of the UK government to bring that expertise uh, to India. Now, if you, uh, the best way to look at our portfolio is probably at three levels. So there's the policy level, then there's the private sector level, and there's the household level. And we are working at each of these three levels, as I mentioned. Uh, an example of what we are doing at the policy level is helping uh, three focus states improve their investment climate, like Bihar, Odisha, Madhya Pradesh. We are also working with the government of India on its infrastructure policies. At the private sector level, what we'll be doing is supporting incubators uh, across the country, but especially low-income states, to improve the number of uh, innovations they are able to incubate, the effectiveness of that service and so on. We'll be also looking at early and growth stage investments, like for instance with the National Innovations Council, affordable housing, infrastructure, and so on. So that's all at the enterprise level or the project level. And the third is the household. So obviously poor households need support if they are able to uh, enjoy the, or take advantage of the economic opportunities that are emerging. And that could be in the form of skills training, that could be in the form of access to finance. Again, this would be more grant than uh, non-grant support. So I'd just like to uh, share with you uh, some of our exciting new investments. So this is just the first few investments that are, uh, that are being made by our partners uh, of this 250 million, we've just about committed less than 10 million. Uh, so one example is uh, Glocal. I don't know how many of you have heard of it, but they've come up with a very sophisticated approach to analyzing the disease burden and coming up with a very efficient way of managing those diseases. So they're setting up this chain of affordable house, uh, of hospitals in the semi-urban and rural areas of the eastern region. 70% of their clients are poor because the RSBY schemes offer reimbursement to poor people, but actually they don't often have decent hospitals to go to uh, in these areas. So I think we think that's a fantastic model. Uh, we are also supporting Shikhar, which is an NGO that wants to move from doing grant work to business-oriented work. So they're setting up a new private sector enterprise, which will support 300 
poor landless people uh, to run a dairy, to actually own a dairy, not run it. It will be run in a professional way, but they'll own the dairy. And this is small amount of money, like 500,000 pounds that needed to set up that dairy, and we feel it's a very good risk for us to take. The third is something that uh, my colleague also mentioned, uh, solar power in the off-grid uh, areas of Uttar Pradesh, where households are spending five rupees a day on kerosene lamps that don't give enough light, give fumes, create carbon emissions. Instead, for the same amount of money, they can get a fantastic light that can light up the entire room really well, uh, which is a solar-powered lantern. So they're coming up with a new business model which uh, links, uh, which provides solar energy not only to household but to the cell phone towers as well. And they, they'll save as much as um, 65,000 tons of CO2 emissions in five years. So there's a lot of good that these kind of, and if you go to the rural areas, you'll see the only pakka building in that entire area is this little solar plant that's been set up by these guys. So they're providing jobs and so on. The interesting thing is that when we are looking at these investments, we realize there are lots of trade-offs to be made. So there'll be some investments that look very safe from the development point of view, but less safe, safe from the financial point of view. There are others which are vice versa, very safe financially, but less safe uh, developmentally. Of course, we love the ones that look safe on both counts. But of course, time will tell uh, what actually turns out to be as good as we expected it to, to be. I'd just like to say that on the policy also, the level, there are lots of innovations that we can look at. So for instance, India has a gap of $1 trillion uh, on infrastructure financing. At the moment, we're not getting sufficient international financing into India because there are certain concerns. But if you could set up a mechanism that uh, increases the comfort level that international investors have with investing in infra projects in India, then that could really create a lot of uh, improvements in the uh, low-income states, particularly, actually, where, 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 where finance is loath to go. Now, in terms of our approach, there are some innovations that we feel um, we're quite happy about, because this is not something that you can count on, that you have a, you have a partnership, and automatically, you know, you can generate financial as well as development returns. We are lucky to have partners that share the dual mandate, yet we have introduced a mechanism by which profit will be shared with fund managers only if both financial and development returns are achieved, not based only on financial, which is the typical standard. The second is that environment, social and governance uh, standards or norms are not often complied with. Once you give the money to the investee, there's no incentive for them to worry about that nor perhaps for the fund manager, for, but for agencies like DFID, it's a big reputational risk, apart from being developmentally negative. So we've actually introduced a financial incentive. So the fund manager will get a financial incentive. We've developed a new kind of indicator that enables us to track the ESG compliance of investees, and that financial incentive will be shared if they do well. And finally, improving development impact. We've talked a little bit about this. We'll be assessing household, not only at enterprise level, but also at household level, and we'll be monetizing this impact so that we can aggregate across diverse sectors like health, education, renewable energy, and so on. So, but we are only at the very, very first step of our journey, and, and we hope to come back with more as we proceed. Thank you. Thank you, Minakshi, for a wonderful presentation. Now, finally, the co-founder and president of Operation Asha. We'll have the last word, Dr. Shelly Batra. A very good afternoon to Dr. Petroda, Honorable Chairperson, <clears throat> and all those who've gathered here from various parts of the world. When I was in medical school, my professors would say, and this was a legacy of the British King George's Medical College, if you do not diagnose, you cannot treat. And that is what innovation is all about. And one more thing comes to my mind. Inclusive growth, promoting shared prosperity, these things are not going to happen unless we build the last mile connectivity with the poorest of the poor, as Operation Asha has done. A low-cost, versatile pipeline 
scalable and replicable that can be used to pump in not just TB, but any kind of health, financial, and any, any other pro product that is needed by the poor. Why tuberculosis, you will wonder? Now, it's the only disease that was diagnosed, uh, that was declared a global emergency by the WHO. These are lesser known facts about TB, and I want to talk about them because it's a fully curable disease, but a global pandemic, and of the eight million new cases in the world, one fourth are in India, and we in India have the dubious distinction of being the TB factory of the world. So we are no, no longer just exporting technology and surgeons and everything else. We are exporting disease. Incomplete treatment, and the treatment, believe me, is tedious. It takes six months visits to a designated center. Incomplete treatment is leading to the dreaded drug-resistant TB with a very high mortality, costing thousands of dollars. London is the MDR TB capital of the world from where TB had been erad eradicated. By 2015, there'll be 1.3 million cases of drug-resistant TB. One and $16 million will be required to treat them. Where is the money going to come from? So we are making things from bad to worse by doing what is called incomplete treatment. Another thing nobody knows, TB is the biggest killer. The number of deaths by TB far eclipses by deaths by all other pandemics combined. And we in India have twice the TB burden of second ranking China, as you can see from this slide. Now, TB is not just a disease. I'll come to a very important point. It's a socioeconomic crisis. I've been talking for three minutes, and two people have died in India already. 100,000 women are thrown out of their families if they get TB. 300,000 children are thrown out of school or forced to leave school to become laborers and earn food for the family if a wage-earning parent has TB. And the loss to the economy in a poor country is horrifying. $23 billion per year is the cost to the Indian economy, and $300 million is the cost incurred, is the cost lost by patients who lose their jobs. Uh, this is just an exciting graph showing how the disease progresses into an epidemic and from there into a global pandemic and global travel and HIV and diabetes in India. These are fueling the epidemic of tuberculosis worldwide. Now we come to the question of the challenges and the gaps in tuberculosis. Now it is very important to realize that the existing public infrastructure lacks the last mile connectivity. We've had the TB control program since independence. Billions of dollars have gone in that. There is a huge infrastructure that is working wonderfully. We have thousands of hospitals, diagnostic centers, free medicines, free doctors, free uh, everything you need, admission facilities, operating facilities. It's all there for free. But when a patient has to go 60 miles, uh, 60 times to a designated TB center, how is he going to accomplish it? And think of centers being open in the usual business hours, 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. So if the choice is between food for the family on one hand and medicine on the other, well, they will go to work and get their wages. And if at all they go for treatment, they take incomplete treatment. When they start feeling better, they stop their treatment halfway, and that's how MDR-TB sets in. So it's the inaccessibility and the inconvenient timing of the centers that is leading to MDR-TB. By MDR, I mean multi-drug resistance. Think of the social stigma now. We've talked of the distance and the bus fare. And by the way, there's no job and no bus fare if you declare you've got TB. People lose jobs. Someone will know. My neighbor will know. My husband will know. He'll say, I get my new model. Why should I live with this wife who's got TB? So many problems. And then the quacks, the first point of contact for TB patients are those who give incomplete irregular treatment. And this is the ecosystem we are working in and a huge cost incurred by other NGOs. And of course, who is there to counsel the poor? Who is there to tell them that complete treatment means life and incomplete treatment means death? And not only death for you, for the family, because you will be spreading MDR-TB in the world like I've shown in the graph before. Another issue is of funding. Government funds for NGOs, too little and too late, unfortunately. And what I always say is that when you've spent billions of dollars and the World Bank has given close to 
$270 million, if I'm right, over the past 10 years to India, then why not spend $80 and utilize the infrastructure that has been made? And this is what we have been doing in Operation Asha. Fudging of data is another problem when targets have to be met. And we have used technology to prevent this very, very important issue. Now, the default rate missing doses, an independent consultant said that the default rate is 36%. 36% cases leave treatment halfway. Half of them get drug resistance. But the country data is different. So what we have done, we have got a local deep model of community empowerment. Deep in the urban slums, we have partnered with local people. These are the priests, the homemakers, shopkeepers. These are convenient high traffic areas. And for economic reasons, centers open early morning and close late night. If I've got a tea shop and there are people who are going to work at 8, my tea shop will open at 8 in the morning until they come back at 10 at night. I'll be willing to sell tea and biscuits and make money. And that is how the patients can get their medicine any time of the day. And the privacy is maintained and nobody needs to know. And they don't have to walk and miss wages. They can go early morning and late, late night. And of course, our costs come down because we are not hiring premises. They are always there for the patients, and we are not giving them a full-time salary. <clears throat> We've also got providers whom we hire from the slums they serve, the communities they serve, who belong to the communities. They are familiar with the informal geography, and they are the ones who do the, do the TB education. I will not go with, be able to go with my accent and talk to a pe particular people. They will not even understand me, and they'll wonder what I'm doing then, why I'm being judgmental. But someone who's living there and eats the same food and celebrates the same uh, function in the same custom, he's the right person to talk to them that this is the medicine you need to take. So it's a local model wherever we go, whether it's in India or in Cambodia. Now, in this slide, you can see what we've done in rural areas. Though that was the urban model. In rural areas, patients are very few, far between. They are scattered. In tribal areas, you have to walk through tiny rivulets, park your car, walk for miles, and then you re reach a hut like the one that is shown over there. And there we have the mobile model where our providers go on motorcycles <laughs> and they build the last mile connectivity physically by going to the doorsteps of the disadvantaged. In Cambodia where we work, again we've got this model. And in the Mekong Delta, oh the river Mekong ends in small islands and there's one patient on one island and another patient on another island miles away. So our provider will go on a bicycle and put the bicycle on a boat and take the boat from island to island. And that is how the doorstep delivery is done. And the doorstep connectivity is made. We carry out a specialized training. And our training is done in order to do active case detection, to destigmatize TB, to take care of the problems of the people. So we listen to the problems of the people. Now a nursing mother will come and say, I've got TB and I'm feeding my baby. What do I do? A mother will come and say, I've got one blanket. And winter in Delhi is approaching. One blanket and five kids and one has got TB. What do we do? So this is the training we give to our providers. They are the ones who are taught to take care of patients, and they go the extra mile, not just for the salaries, because they are motivated by the role. They are treated like doctors in the community. And they themselves feel that because of technology that we've given them, the laptops and the technology training, their skill sets are going up. And this is what creative innovation is all about. We listen to the problems of the people, and we adapt accordingly. Another thing we've done is, and the most important thing is, <clears throat> is the partnership with the Indian government. So I always say the think of the human body. There is the human body, and these are the arms extending into the, deep into the disadvantaged areas where the human body cannot go. The arms can go and provide the outreach. And this is what a community-based model looks like. We leverage the community leaders and the religious leaders. And someone in the previous panel was talking of Muradabad and the brass workers. And in Muradabad, the TB problem is horrible because of the huge amount of uh, dust inhaled at the time of the factory uh, workers. So we utilize the, uh, the religious leaders to, give, uh, to talk about tuberculosis and the need to work in TB. We've got a scalable and replicable model, a cost-effective model. And 
The most important thing is we've utilized quacks by making them join our system. We have started using technology about three years ago, and we use, believe that technology has the power to solve the public health problems of the world, to ensure every dose taken, to prevent any kind of fudging of data. <laughs> Are our providers going to people's houses and doing the tracking? That can be done. Is every patient coming to the system, to the center to take the treatment? Well, a fingerprint cannot be fudged. A fingerprint is indisputable proof of visit. So this was developed by commercially available off-the-shelf components. It's a low-cost device. As you can see, there is an Android netbook. Costs very little. The fingerprint reader costs next to nothing. You combine them and you have your technology device. And we have seen that with this technology device, our default is down to less than 3%. So we have effectively turned the tap on MDR-TB. It is easy to use for semi-literate people. There is color coding, there is minimal text, but I believe also that technology cannot be made in a fancy lab and dumped on the disadvantaged. So the technology has been made in accordance to the needs and the requirement of the people and their IQ. We've put in GPS uh, tagging, the frontier software. We've converted it into a zero text application for many other uses. And the most important thing is that this technology can be replicated and modified for any kind of disease. We are the most cost-effective organization. We have scaled rapidly. We've provided a huge impact, a social return on investment of an unbelievable 2,017%. And I feel now that we have to use this pipeline and we've been using it to give contraceptives, to do financial services, micro health insurance, accident insurance, the lot. And it has worked very well. Uh, before I conclude, let me say that the country director owner rule, country director World Bank visited us, and he wrote in his blog, the last mile at last, which summed up our program. And he believes, and I think all of us will believe, that by providing this connectivity, we can provide a lot of services to the disadvantage. Well, awards are very good, recognition is sweet, but ultimately, it's work that matters, and with your support, the fight goes on. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. You know, we started at five minutes past four and we have done it in 90 minutes, I think. Exactly. It's in, huh? I'm a, I'm it, yes, and it's incredible, so I want to thank all the panelists. Uh, we would not have time for discussion, as you can see, because uh, there is a constraint that we should have left by five o'clock. We are already overstayed until 5.30, so I want to keep my... Uh, promise. Just one last remark uh, I wanted to make. Uh, one is uh, that we began the talk when uh, Sir Ronald Cohen said, uh, talked about act of giving. I hope all of you know that there is a law of giving now. From act of giving we have moved to art of giving to uh, uh, act of giving or a law of giving and that is 2% of the net profit uh, of companies over a particular turnover have to actually contribute to social corporate responsibility. And that sum comes to something like 20 to 25,000 crore, which is close to $5 billion, 4 to $5 billion, and that will be available uh, from this year onwards uh, in India, and it's all about making use of it. But finally, at the end of the day, you know, there is something called doing well and doing good. You do well, you make a lot of money, you give that 2%, etc., and then you do good. But I think the sustainable model is going to be finally doing well by doing good. All right, how do you create all these social enterprises which balance out people, planet, and not necessarily profit, but prosperity, prosperity uh, for all. Uh, I think the biggest vision that we can have is uh, that of uh, having smile on the faces of 7 billion people on the face of this world. And what we are discussing today are the first tiny steps to make that happen. Uh, I'd like to conclude here. Uh, there are some announcements I have to make. First, please share your passport details at reception for entry into Rashtrapati Bhavan tomorrow for foreign delegates. This is for foreign delegates. Second, uh, the bus to Rashtrapati Bhavan will leave at 4 p.m. tomorrow from here. And finally, our wonderful, gracious host, Sam Pitroda, 
is uh, hosting a dinner for us at 8 p.m. at Taj Man Singh Hotel and see you there. Thank you very much.